My guest today is Glenn Block. Glenn, welcome back. Thanks, David. Great to be back. I feel like I was just here. I know you were just here. So, but of course, the here is all you know virtual <laughs> yeah. in this new world. But that's I the new how, when I was saying Seattle doing these here days. now. I, I rarely mean physically anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the reason you're back is because we were, we started talking uh, about another topic like maybe a month ago, and you uh, you started going telling me about your passion for um, the social justice and racial justice and uh, all the uh, issues that are happening today. And I, I said, this is a great topic, but we can't cover this in one show. Let's, let's do another show on this. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think 2020, for all its craziness, one of the things that's happening is it's shining a light on some of these issues, some of these issues that... Uh, are affecting all of us and affect our relationship between races, between classes, between people in general. It is, is shining a light, and it's important. Uh, so, first, thank you so much for having me on the show, David. And oh, and thank you. you know, this is this is a topic that is really important to me. Of course, not only me, but definitely something that has become more important to me over the years. And I think a lot of people followed me in the past purely for like my thoughts around technology. And probably started to notice in the last three years, especially, that that started to shift. Um, and I started to really try to be more outspoken as I was learning more about the, the, the situations we're seeing. As far as shining a light, I think it's important when you say that to recognize that for the issues that the light is being shined on are not new issues. Yes. And so there's a huge amount of frustration in the communities that have been affected that it's like, oh, like we've been saying this for 20 years. Like, this is not new. George Floyd is not new. George Floyd just got caught on camera in a way that is cannot be denied, right? Breonna so, Taylor. And, I mean, the world is changing. And although well, there are more cameras media, out there now, is one of the issues that cameras so seeing, are there. We're and we're just more, more connected, right? It's I, I go back and forth about the pros and cons of social media, and there's definitely a lot of negatives that are out there but reality of it is is it has helped us things like facebook and other things have also helped us to get more connected and to use these things as vehicles to communicate the injustices that are occurring um so yeah but i do agree with you that the light is getting shined but i think there's also a very real concern about the fact that people have woken up but are they going to go back to sleep and we're already seeing signs of that like when, it, when everything first really like hit the fan, so to speak, you saw lots of organizations stepping up, speaking out, lots of people, especially like white people, started to step up. And some, some many were saying, like, I didn't realize this, which I think was even very frustrating for many to hear that. But reality yeah. of it is did and started That's to do true. actions. But it's like and we're out there in the protests and a bunch of other stuff. But now you know, things are moving on and it's kind of like not that much has changed except for the fact that we definitely have had some very loud voices. Um, but, you know, these are systemic, huge problems. And so I think there is that concern of like, are those that started to become outspoken going to go back to sleep? Yeah, I think you bring up a good point that a lot of us really didn't realize this. I, I, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a, a almost 100 percent white communities in yeah. Detroit. Um, and uh, it, it really wasn't even talked about. I mean, we just, uh, I guess we're kind of vaguely aware of the history of this country. And we thought we thought we were progressive. We thought we weren't prejudiced. But I yep. look back on myself at that time and I, I see some things that I'm kind of embarrassed about. Well, and I'm the same way. You know, I grew up in Long Island. I grew up in a very segregated place where, you know, there were some people of color in my school. There were neighborhoods. Honestly, there were the black neighborhoods. I mean, I grew up right. in Long Island, Freeport, Hempstead. These were known as black neighborhoods. I'm just being really vulnerable here. I'm not proud of this, but that was the way it was. And when I drove in those neighborhoods, I was like locking my doors. Um, and why is that? And, and that's why when you said like, oh, we thought we weren't racist. The biggest learning I've had over the last couple of years, and also I've been going to school and I'm in a social justice slash leadership program as part of my MBA. So I'm learning a lot oh. also as I just read more scholarly things and more, more books about 
people that speak on this topic, but this concept of institutionalized racism, right? It's, it's, we think many of us have thought like racism is like the KKK or a swastika or using the N word. But reality right. of it is it is much, much deeper than that. It is into the fabric of our society. And like you said, because of the fact that you grew up in a neighborhood where you really weren't around people of color, then you also don't understand the challenge, not pointing you out, but all of us don't really understand the challenges and the experiences. And so we tend to try to normalize them and say, well, our experience must be their experience, but it's not. Yeah, I think um, uh, you hit it on the head uh, that uh, we didn't realize it. And I would never have thought of using the N word when I was a kid. I, I thought that made me a good person. But uh, I did, I, I would see people and the way they looked, the color of their skin, and I would make assumptions about them. And, and yeah. there's nothing wrong with making assumptions about people, about the world around you, by sure. what you see. You need to simplify the world around you. It's just, it's just too complex. Uh, but some of those assumptions are not good. Yeah, and I, I recognize. I recognize that because I no longer live in an all-white neighborhood. I no longer stick to my neighborhood. I've, I've gone out. I've seen the world. I've met people of all different colors, races, religions, um, cultures, uh, orientations. I, I, I've had that. Opera. I've been blessed with that opportunity. It's changed my world. Same. Same with me. My world really changed. Uh, you know, as I got older. But that was not the experience when I was younger. And first, I want to you know thank you. For sharing and being vulnerable because I think all of you know making these changes a big part of it is about vulnerability which is about people like you're doing having hard conversations with themselves to, to be a, and becoming aware of things that they were not aware of before um, and realizing that those things are actually causing harm right because yeah. and I think that's the key thing is like we so to your point Meeting people that don't look like you will change you if you let it, if you go in and with empathy and you really try to learn and then you realize, hey, our experience actually are not the same. And, and the problem with that is that because many times there are people that are making decisions because the reality of it is, is that the people that are in power in this country are mostly male and people like that look like you and me that are white. And by not having those that context and understanding the challenges that others are facing, that means that when they're making policy decisions, those policy decisions can be inequitable. And I think another thing that's really important that I've learned more recently in my journey is it's not about equality, it's about equity. The experiences are not, there's a huge difference, right? Equality is actually about saying that you and I get the same thing. Equity is more about what is appropriate based on our experiences. And our experiences are just not the same. And so if you talk to a lot of, for example, African-Americans and African-American women who will talk about, you know, what they want or people of color, it's equity. Equity is what they want. Something to find equity. Equitable is about fairness. Okay. Can you give me an example? Um. What would be an example? Well, uh, as an example, I guess, of equity would be like in the workplace, understanding that what, you know, that what folks who are African-American, there may be certain things that are triggering to somebody who's African-American right now. Okay. But that doesn't affect white people, let's say. Right. So 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 in an equitable environment, like it's like they don't want exactly the same treatment. It's there are certain. It, I'm just using that as an example, but there are many, no, no, sure, many other great. examples. And work, you can look up, you can look up equity. I mean, you, what was that? Like joke, jokes in the workplace, for example. You know, I could tell you a joke. You might not be offended by it. Someone else uh, it, it may be the victim of that joke. And it may be a yeah, and, huge and I think it's also about treatment. So it's like if we, I talked about the policy decisions, like recognizing, for example, the barriers that people in African-American communities face. Um, barriers of access, especially marginalized communities, I'll say, uh, barriers to access to certain types of resources, right? So, so that, that actually becomes more of kind of a, a, an equity thing because decisions are made based on resources that white people have available to them, but, but, but blacks don't. So, um, you know, it may be that you can change the situation of the resources That would be, you could say, more equality of like making sure the same resources are available to everybody. 
but it, but an equity discussion is saying, okay, well, based on the fact that there's these realities that are just are what they are, what can we do to kind of more level the playing field? I think equity is more about leveling based on experience than necessarily equal. Um, that's a good point here. So you, you were talking about the lawmakers are uh, not representative necessarily of the groups that they're uh, making these laws for, like a lot of old white men are in power in this country. Uh, but I don't know if we're going to change them through this video, but maybe we can change people, like people like you and me. And here here yeah. we are, we're two white guys talking about racial justice. We, we are part of the privilege class, right? We, we're, Absolutely. We, we want to be allies, yeah. but we're not we're not experiencing what um, the, the marginalized groups are supposed to How could we Exactly. So privilege brings power, right? So I yeah. think... How can we use that, that power? Recognizing you? that you're privileged, recognizing that you have power to make a difference, um, that's that's really what your responsibility to do is as being that person of privilege. What's uh, what, what can we do? Tell, tell me what I could do better. Sure. Um, well, one simple thing is just listening and not rushing to judgment, especially okay. when you're looking at what's happening in the world, when you're talking to people uh, who don't look like you, understanding, again, this is that equity thing, that their experiences are different than your experiences. And it's not that they're ever gonna be the same. That's that's also the reality of people coming from different cultures and different backgrounds. What's important to you might not be important to them. And that's not gonna change and that shouldn't change. But recognizing that. Um, okay. So I think that's one thing is to really- That seems like step one. Step one is you know listening. Right. Um, I, I, another part of step one is recognizing like you don't know and you don't have to know. So what really becomes damaging when you start this work is you trying to take up the airspace in the conversation. You might be doing it in a well-meaning way, um, but but going in with a mindset of like, I don't know, and I'm not the one who's experiencing this, as you said. So what I really need to understand is like, you know, what are the problems? What are the perceived problems? One thing I can do is make sure I'm not part of the problem and I'm part of the solution. So having hard conversations with yourself. I honestly believe, honestly believe that where this really begins is looking inward. You have to start looking inward and realize it's not them, it's you. I did a blog post on this where I talked about my own white privilege and my own recognition. And this was after... Uh, Ahmed Arbery and George Floyd, like all, all uh, Breonna Taylor uh, and George Floyd. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll share it with you. It's on Medium. But in that, I basically was like, it's not them, it's you. And that's what institutionalized racism is about. That, you know, we think, uh, and there's a great author that I'll mention. His name is Ibram Kendi, and he wrote a book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And in that book, he basically says there is no middle way. Like you are either uh, you are either an anti-racist or you are a racist. And now a whole bunch of people will come up in arms and say, well, what does that mean? Like, I don't see race. But the reality of it is because we live in this institutionalized racist society, we have been hearing certain messages and acting according to certain fashion from the time we were very, very young. And so by actually saying like, I don't see race, what you're really doing is not acknowledging that there actually are these issues that play out in society. And without having awareness, you're not going to do anything different. So it starts with looking inward and building awareness. Um, and you mentioned a couple of times uh, systemic racism and institutional racism, which I'm not sure if they're exactly the same thing, but certainly would make They are. I mean, they're both. Can you define those? Institutionalized racism basically says here's the thing when people say, like, oh, slavery was 400 years ago or 400 plus years ago. What does that have to do with me? Well, <laughs> well it was actually 150 that, years ago, but <laughs> 170 years ago. <laughs> that happens all the time that people say, well, I remember when it started, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so people always say that comment, right? And then, and then, and then uh, you know, really what they're trying to say is like, yeah, it was bad, but what does that have to do with me, right? So right. Yeah. when you look I, at- I them, didn't enslave them. I'm not when you look at it from an institutionalized racist lens, you realize that, you know, when this country was formed and the ideals and a lot of the principles that were baked in even to our, our government and our policy and our learning, like what did we teach as parents to our kids? 
that that was a domino effect. That began a domino effect that continued all the way to this day. That, you know, if I'm on a job interview, for example, and because I am not self-aware, you know, I look at somebody and I don't offer them the job. And like, is it really because of their skills or is it because of racial biases and preferences that I have within me? That Those biases exist much in part because of institutionalized racism, because of the messages we heard. You know, I think about for myself when I was a kid hearing my grandmother, who, who is no longer with us, who used to say derogatory comments around yeah. around black people. Um, and what effect did that have on me? Like, yeah, I was a little kid. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. But but those messages and the way we see people treat us being in those uh, environments affect us. They affect what we do. They affect our decision making. They affect everything. And that's why that is still alive and well today. Redlining is a great term that if you don't know about it, you will be shocked. And redlining. What is redlining? Redlining basically means zoning, where like where redlining comes out is like when communities were being built up and where the architects of those communities, which are mostly like white guys, actually said, like, we are going to zone these in a way that black people are not going to be welcome, that black people cannot live there. And this is like on the books. There is no denying. When you look at the country we live in now, a lot of the reasons why neighborhoods like the one I mentioned, like Freeport existed, is because of redlining, because policies were put in place so that only people that were white would benefit from those policies. That is very real, and that is still alive and well today in this country. That's an example of something that is uh, what is called structural racism, um, which is where it's really been embedded into the fabric of, of, of how we do things in a way that is going to continually affect marginalized groups. Why do you think so many people are in denial that institutional racism is even a thing? I, I hear this on television all the time. No, everybody's responsible for themselves. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah. I, look, I at that, look at that black guy over there. He's successful. Why aren't you successful? Yep. I'm not the master of that, but I think that, you know, of course, I have my own opinions. And my opinion is one. I want, I want your opinion. About, one huge part is about accountability. If I accept that what you're saying is true, that means that I am accountable. I believe personally that I am accountable. Like there are actions that I do that have affected people that don't look like me. I absolutely believe that. I have benefited from policies that have targeted people that look like me so that we benefit. But do I just say, well, that's not my fault. Those are the policies. Or do I do something to try to change them to bring a more equitable situation? So I think one of them really is about denial of accountability. There, you know, it just if I accept what you're saying, it means I have to change. I don't want to change. It's also about privilege, though. It's not affecting me. So I remember, and you know, I think you know him, Michael Brown, who works with us at Microsoft, who sure, ran the conference, a pivotal moment in my own journey was a conversation that he and I had years ago when uh, when a, when and there was a black man, I remember who was who was shot by cops and, uh, you know, pulled over and, and shot. It might have been like, uh, it doesn't matter exactly who it was. So and I remember talking with Michael and he was talking about how, you know, as a black man, we teach our kids, uh, you know, or as a black parent, we teach our kids like they know if they get pulled over by cops, how to react, right? So for me, when I heard that, like the first thing I was like, well, I don't actually get pulled over by cops. That's first. <laughs> I have been shocked by, as I've gone out of my way to make more connections with people that don't look like me, especially in the black community, how common that is. How common that is to get pulled over, doesn't matter who, where you are in your career, whether you're a CEO, doesn't matter, Gover whether you are a governor, you will get pulled over. It will happen. So that was the first thing. The second one is if I do get pulled over, like it's because, you know, if I was speeding or something, the first thing that goes to my mind is like, this cop is trying to make his quota. Not my life might be in jeopardy. So privilege allows us to see things only from our own lens. And that's why it's like, my life is good. I don't have to deal with this. 
So I think it's the combination of, you know, that lack of wanting to have accountability uh, and, the, and, the, and what that means, as well as privilege, like you're in a privileged place, so you don't have to do anything about it. You can choose to just keep living your life the way that you can. I do think there is naivety there. There is ignorance there. There are people that don't know. Um, but then there's also people that don't want to know. And I have seen both flavors. And I try to put more of my energy with people that don't know and that are willing to learn than those that are like, I'm not going to open myself to that. I'm going to keep a very fixed mindset because it's going to enable me to keep living my life the way that I want to, and life is good. Yeah, I, I struggle against that myself. I get comfortable in it. We all do. We all struggle with that, right? And, and by the way, I have been pulled over before. <laughs> However, I've never once, during any of those, pull, those uh, traffic stops, thought to myself, I might get shot. This cop I've been pulled shot. over. And, uh, and I, I know there are people that, that that's a reality. That's, that's and imagine if there's a family in the car. Imagine the trauma of like being pulled over with your wife in the car. Your wife knows you might get killed. Your wife is worried about the rest of the family. I mean, this is a very real thing that is very not real for me. <laughs> and I'm the first to say that. That is privilege. Um, there's there's some great articles out there that talk about uh, that talk about privilege. Um, there is the and I'll I'll share a link on it. It was something we we looked at in school too. Peggy McIntosh uh, unpacking the um, knapsack. Uh, what's the article? Hold on a second. It's a very famous uh, uh, kind of work where she basically went and analyzed privilege and and broke down exactly what it means like. What does it mean as being a white person? What does it mean as being a man versus a woman? Where does privilege really play in? Uh, there it is. Unpacking the invisible net pack. Yeah. Nap so please Naps share that. That is a and just read it. And so you know, just take it in. Don't judge. Again, I said, don't rush to judgment. Just open your mind and read it and understand that your reality is different. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, technology. Yeah, this let's do it. Tech show. This is a, this is um, a tech show. But yeah, I, yeah, what, what, but what I, part does technology that, have? I am, before we yeah. do that, I am so thankful that you're willing. You know that you were holding a space to have this kind of conversation. That that means so much to me, David. So oh, thank, thank you. you. I, I uh, it's, I'm I get something out of this. I, I'm still evolving, so it's good for me. I hope uh, other people get something out of it as well. Um, but it was, so what, what part does, uh, you know, you're a technologist, you've been working with uh, tools for a long time. What part does technology play in this, in the problem and in the solution? It plays a lot. Um, and honestly, my journey very much was connected to technology. It was very much connected initially, and this plays out across gender and across race, but we're focusing on race and particularly um, African Americans. Um, and I think one thing that's really important too is when we talk about normalization, like, the experiences of people that look like us are all not the same, and it's easy to bucket. And you know, a lot of black people, for example, who who experience racism on a different level, um, tend to get bucketed in certain conversations. It's like, oh, all people of color, you know, whether you're Asian or black or this, but the experiences are not the same. It doesn't mean that one is better than the other. It just means they are not the same. And when we normalize them, that in itself is a problem. Um, I think it plays out in a zillion ways that we don't have time to talk about, but let's just say hiring is one. Okay? okay, so I know a woman firsthand who was on an interview and an interviewer liked her hair and wanted to touch her hair. Um, it's a black woman, and this happens all the freaking time. I wrote a LinkedIn post about it because I was like, what is it, white people, with needing to touch a black person's hair? But it's like it doesn't get received well. It doesn't make somebody feel comfortable and i have never in any of my interviews in 20 plus years ever had and this happens to men too like somebody asked me i'd love to touch your hair or your hair looks so great so i think it absolutely affects the hiring process and if you happen to be somebody who speaks up there's a lot of evidence that you will not get that job like those companies so the bias is there the bias is there in the hiring process the bias is there in looking at candidates. There is lots of data that shows that if somebody has a black sounding name, 
they have a much lesser likelihood of getting callbacks from jobs, from recruiters. If they have photos and their photo is of somebody that is black versus white, so it plays out deeply. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. It plays out in organizations. Is there fair? I talked about fairness. Are people being given the opportunities that they should be giving? And one that has been really important to me is mentoring. So it is well known that people tend to mentor people that look like them and that white people, especially white males, have really benefited in their careers by having mentors who took them under the wing. Well, that's a great example of equal access. Like if I'm a person of color and I don't have access to that same level of mentoring, that is going to directly impact my career and the opportunities that come my way. So um, and it's how we treat each other in meetings. Like there's a person of color in the room or a black person in, in the room. Do you talk over them? Do you you know, are they are they are you sensitive to things that you say? Do you make comments? That are offensive. Again, this is not only for blacks. It, it affects others as well. But I'm just laser sure. focusing no, there. That part of it, I hear, uh, I hear from. Are they getting promos? Uh, are they perce- You know, if they speak out about racial issues, are they castigated? Are they like, oh, you know, this person's difficult? Um, there, there's just it's it's too many to talk about. But it definitely comments. People make comments. Managers make comments that are offhand comments that are that are offensive that 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 hurt black people and people of color so that's one aspect which is just like how we work how we operate there's how we build products like many of the products in the past like if white people build them they build them catering to customer that they imagine in their head is a white person but again that's an example of equity not equality like, oh. is that the right experience? And there is actually lots of data that shows that it's not. And you might I'm be interested in that. Is, is there an example? Can you think of an example of a, I a product think that's a, I, I, good? I don't want to make something up and think of an example, but yeah. I can tell you it is a real thing. Um, and so, you know, this is something that companies like Google are spending a huge amount of energy, and we are too, in focusing on making sure that we have diverse representation within our product teams to ensure that the products that we're building are going to actually target a an, a diverse audience. Um, oh yeah, that, actually, that's something that uh, you introduced me to, Alexandra, and she brought that up. That uh, yep. there's teams, there, there is teams. She's been on teams that weren't very diverse. They were trying to do artificial intelligence, and they, they did benefit from that. I, I think I think AI is one of the scariest ones, and I think so, I think, how, so there's a product right there, <laughs> all the AI products that uh, maybe could benefit from better diversity among the development team, among the testing team. These algorithms are biased if they're not. And now this goes back to that anti-racism discussion. If you go with the hard wiring and you just go with the motions and do things the way that we do, then those algorithms get built in a way that is not conscious of the fact that they could actually be acting in a way that injures people from marginalized groups. And to give an example, I mean, we've seen a lot of recent examples of that, but one that I like to call out, which we also talked about um, in my school, is back in uh, 2018, Amazon killed uh, an HR, like a a project that they were building, which was essentially being able to analyze candidate resumes and profiles through AI. And it was proven that it was biased. It was proven and they shelved it, right? So Mm -hmm. why was it biased? Because the algorithms were playing to things that, you know, were very common let's say for white people or white males, and it was inordinately biased in terms of giving those things higher weight. Um, And that had a direct, that would have had a direct impact and kudos to them that they identified that and did the right thing and kind of shut it down. Um, There's a lot of work going on now with, uh, with using AI for visual recognition. And just recently, I mean, maybe it was like six, eight months ago, there was this article about a woman who was trying to use a service that required you to upload your ID. And she was a dark black woman and it couldn't identify her. Oh, so it just didn't, didn't recognize her face. It didn't recognize a black person. And this face. is talking about access to services, right? So think about the, uh, ca- you know, the, the domino effect of things like that. So I think AI is huge. Um, but I, I think another aspect that's real interesting uh, 
which which I like to talk about and kudos to them is in tech we use a lot of terms that recently folks that are don't look like me have started to speak out in technology and say those terms are uncomfortable but they've been used forever right and so one is the master slave thing right, right. so so I've used that master slave term all the time. Yeah. Every hard, every hard drive, the second hard drive, master, master slave. Yeah, that Ruben. any kind of architecture, right? Master slave. It's beautiful. And and then you know, like people started to come out and say, well, this actually makes me feel uncomfortable, because reality of it was like maybe it was intended to not mean that, but re and it's debatable actually as you really dig into it. Not that they intended to replicate that but the idea that a master is in charge of the slaves yeah that's the to not well. say and i will laugh at you if you try to tell me that that is not the message that that is sending now slave <laughs> yeah. in that case means something different well, but again, master, it's, master yeah. means a lot of things but slave means slave there's not a whole lot of meanings to that <laughs> but if you normalize experiences like yeah. i use that all the time i never really thought about it I but didn't. People that didn't look like me came out and started to say, well, no, that actually is offensive. Like, I don't like that. And that led up to, so first off, the interesting thing is when that happens, you know, you get some people that are religiously against changing these things that have been in the industry for a long time. You know what? That's fixed mindset. Yeah. That to me, like you can put whatever name you want to put on it. That is a fixed mindset. That is like, this is the way it is. We're not going to change it. We're not going to listen to anything else. And the other place where that recently became a big hot button, I think, in technology is around the move that GitHub made. Oh, where they yeah, said, the hey, master they're branches. no longer going to call our default branch master. Um, and again, you could almost take the same parallel. And everybody came out trying to explain it, you know, going back to Linus Torvald's initial discussion. It doesn't matter. Because the other part of this work is that it's not just about intention. It's really about how are things being perceived and what kind of harm is that causing? So far as I'm concerned, even if the person who wrote the document that invented the master repo said, this is absolutely nothing to do with, you know, slavery and this and that, and that, it doesn't matter. Because I saw my Twitter feed fill up with people that don't look like me who were saying it matters to me and it makes me feel uncomfortable. So recently I created my first repo that used main as the default. Oh, and congratulations. Like, this actually feels right. And the world this didn't end because you renamed the, the, the And a whole bunch of people were like, oh, that's purely performative. I don't believe it is. I actually no. think like, yeah, there's lots of big things we need to do. And it's not like you shouldn't do, you know, the small things take the place of that. Like, is that taking the place of protesting against racism or talking to your officials? No, but every little thing ads, right? If that makes somebody who is feeling oppressed in any way feel a no oppressed, then we should do it. That's my take on it. And I, I give, you know, I happen to work for Microsoft again, and we own GitHub, so you could say that's self-serving, but I was really happy when I saw them do that. I felt like it was a good move. And I saw a lot of people, again, black folks who were saying that they were happy that that move happened. Yeah, I think that's uh, it brings up a good point that it's not up to us to decide. It's not up to me to decide what's offensive to you. It's up to you to decide that. And then it's up to me. Tell to me. It's yeah, up to you. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I shouldn't say you. I should say the the, the marginalized groups. No, no, no. You have no. They're the ones that are. Violent. You're you're nailing it. And people yeah. do that. And what do they try to do? And this is you know lack of empathy and understanding is try to explain. Right. It's almost like white splaining. Like, no, 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 <laughs> you don't get it. Like I was in the original thread. I replied to, you know, Linus when he wrote that. It doesn't matter. That is just simply dismissing. That's not yeah. hearing. That's like, no, no, it's you. We're going to that's my you know, that's that fixed mindset. So I think like I would really push on if we really want to make changes. Here's a couple of key things I'll say one. We have to start to get to know, like white people have to start to really get to know people that don't look like them. And, and re like not just like in a meeting at work that's around diversity and allyship, but like in our lives, change those patterns. Because that to me, I believe will be the biggest change when we're actually 
getting to know one another and listening and understanding and building that empathy and understanding those challenges. Because then when we're in a place where a policy decision is going to be made, we will be conscious and we will speak up, hopefully, to stop the things that we see happening that are perpetuating that injustice. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I, I'll share with you, I, I was um, at a community meeting about a month ago this summer. That a couple of churches got together and had an outdoor kind of talks and Q&A. And one of the speakers he said something that really resonated with me. He said that he was talking to a preacher a while uh, earlier in his life and who was talking about diversity and the need for uh, expanding your network of people to include, just as exactly I said, people that are different, that look different from you. And he said, well, when he came with me, he said, he summarized by saying, so I guess I need more black friends. I need to get find more black friends. And the preacher told him, you know what? I think you're looking at the wrong way. You're looking at it as if you are the one bringing something to a relationship with a black person. Sure. Turn that around and realize they, that you are benefiting. You're missing out. You're, you're missing out by not having uh, these people in your life, these people that are very different from you. And uh, this, he was telling a story of something that happened good. years before, and he and telling us all that he, this guy was absolutely right. That, uh, his life is better because not all of his friends look like him. That's a great point. Yeah, that's a great point. And there's, you know, there's a lot of discussions around diversity for businesses in that, you know, forgetting about the right side of it, like, which is like, it's the right thing to do in terms of social justice and treating people fairly. But there's so much data that shows that organizations that have a diverse makeup do better. They deliver better services. They deliver better quality. They, they, perform better so it's uh it, it has some very tactical aspects to it i i try not to focus so much on those because i think at the end of the day like as human beings we're, we're here to treat each other well and to fairness to be fair um so i think uh, but but there is so much data that shows that just if you talk purely dollars and cents having a more diverse inclusive environment makes sense for businesses. Have you ever been a victim of any racism or prejudice? I have been a victim of prejudice, um, mostly be through my religious lens. So I'm Muslim. Um, I converted to Islam when I was 19 years old. Uh, many people who know me know this, many people who are probably hearing this for the first time, and I, I practice, and I have experienced a lot of bias. Um, and I'm happy to say that Microsoft has been one of the best companies I've worked at where uh, that has really been, you know, far, far less. But I have definitely experienced both inside and outside the workplaces, you know, people thinking I'm a terrorist, people, you know, thinking I hate women, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of all the stereotypes right? that my prophet is a pedophile. I mean, all these kinds of things that that have definitely impacted me. Um, throughout my life. And I do channel that, like, and I think this is important. Like, we need to, to grab onto the experiences that we can. And I don't in any way say that that replaces the experiences of, of what a black person has experienced, but I certainly have seen. And honestly, in these last couple of years, you know, looking at the tide of hatred against Muslims in this country and the fear that has been sown even by our politicians, absolutely affects me absolutely okay. affected me affected my family my daughter used to cover she chose to cover we had people that followed her down the street um you know people that said threatening things to her i saw more more actually through her eyes and watching what she went through than even my own but that that probably is the most significant place that i've experienced it's not racism per se but definitely hatred and bias and prejudice for people that are different than you. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, in some ways it uh, probably helped to have that experience to develop empathy for other marginalized groups. I think it definitely has fueled that. And you know, I mentioned how I grew up in this environment where I was mostly around white people and that actually changed when I became Muslim. I suddenly was you know, going to the mosque and seeing people from all over the world. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I grew up in a Jewish family so we didn't have high opinions of Arabs, for example. And when I became Muslim, I had, you know, lots of lots of Arab friends, people from all over the, 
the Middle East. Um, and, I, you know, I wouldn't say flat out that, like, my family was against people that from, from you know, that were Arab, but it definitely didn't have a lot of Arabs in our family that were, friend, you know, friends. And, um, you know, there there's a whole bunch of issues uh, in the community and political issues and other things that it, it gets very messy. But, uh, but yeah, but that definitely has fueled my awareness more uh, around social justice issues and, and fed into who I am today. Yeah, I think that's what I was trying to describe about my upbringing is that people that I, I grew up with, they weren't, they didn't hate minorities, but there were, I think, they didn't, um, I think they thought less of it. And maybe, and maybe I did as well. That's why I'm sort of reevaluating who I um, And because we didn't see them, but they just weren't a part of our lives. They were. And that so, makes a really important point going back to tech is, you know, people talk a lot about the pipeline. You know, the, is there a pipeline problem? Oh, yeah, the deployment you know, pipeline. So you know, we can't we can't a have a, uh, a minority executive because there's nobody in the in middle management. That's and it was just a very controversial statement, actually, that the CEO of Wells Fargo is now pulling back that literally just made where he was talking about the lack of availability of people to become like, you know, black executives was basically saying he was basically saying it's a pipeline problem and that caused a, a huge amount of uh, people to be very upset about that but where it plays out in technology is like a lot of the companies that I've worked in really value referrals mm -hmm. well if the people in my network look like me who yeah. are the referrals sure. and if those are the referrals who's not getting those jobs and directly and that is also structural that is also a structural racism thing because that happens Everywhere. I can think of every tech company that I've worked in. And now I stop myself. I mean, I and I was doing this. Oh, I got to hire this person. Oh, I got to hire that person. That person's awesome. Like they really know the technology. But doing that helped ensure that I was surrounded by people that I knew and people that looked like me. I mean, as my network has changed, then the people that I've brought in have been more and also I'm being more intentional about it. So I think that's another key thing here is the importance of intentionality, which is like if you really want to change things, it's not going to just happen. You have to be intentional about it. And I'm trying to live my life now every day in general being intentional, but and, and especially around uh, racial justice. Well, Glenn, this is, I mean, this is a big topic and we've covered a lot of it. Is there something that we, you really want to say that uh, we haven't covered yet? There's a book, a couple of books <laughs> that I could recommend that people read, which are Please. really eye-opening, especially if you're like on this journey and you want to learn more and learn about allyship and learn about the structural racism challenges. So one I mentioned was Ibram Kendi uh, about how to be an anti-racist. Another great book is by a woman named Ijoma, Ijoma Olu, and that is So You Want to Talk About Race. And she actually lives in Seattle, uh, she's amazing. She has experienced a lot of racism. Um, she's an African American, uh, African woman actually, who, who came from her family was from Africa. Mm -hmm. But that book is just incredible in talking about her experiences. And another really poignant, great book is a book called *The Memo* by Minda Hartz, which really talks about the challenges that Black women face uh, in corporate America. And 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 the memo really was written for black people. It was written for black women to help them uh, give strategies that Minda has found and others have found successful. But it's really good for people, for white people to read and understand the experiences of their coworkers that are black mm -hmm. and how to be self-aware and not do the things that that book talks about. So those are three really uh, great resources. There's so many others, but, and, and that, uh, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack by Peggy McIntosh. Definitely recommend people read that as well. That's just a white paper. This looks like a it's white paper. ten pages. Yeah, uh, great. I, I, I'm googling these as uh, as you, as fast as I can, and I will put links to these in the show notes. Excellent. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and also uh, the courage of opening up about your experiences, your passion for what this is all about. Uh, I want to be a better ally, so this is really good for me. This is wonderful, David. And this is a journey. I guess the parting thing I would say is that you're going to make mistakes. 
I am making mistakes all the time, but you know, it, you're, you're never going to get better if you don't make those mistakes. And I would say, go into that with a growth mindset. Don't dwell on the mistake, try to learn it and do better. Um, but you will make mistakes. This is not going to be an easy. There is no certificate. Like there's <laughs> not like, oh, I got my allyship certificate. I got this. I got my seventy five percent. I passed. I can relax. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many courses you've gotten, and even if you've gotten a certificate, it doesn't count. Like this is a lifelong journey, and you just have to commit to it and just keep doing it. And you know, don't overwhelm yourself. Do a little bit better. Try to be a little bit better each day, That's and you nice. will get better, and you will. You will make a difference. I've noticed that uh, in person, uh, if you're making an effort, people appreciate that. And they do. And, uh, people and on, about... on, on social media, maybe not so much. People are a little bit more quick to judge. But in, in, in person, those mistakes are forgiven. I've made plenty of them. And uh, I think a lot nice. of it goes to sincerity and your yeah. willingness to learn. You know, if people perceive that you've done something out of error and you had good intention versus uh, you know, if you're just saying, well, that's the way it is, or how could you say that or whatever. Um, I think another thing, though, it's really important to remember. I know I keep adding to this. No is that the fact that you had a good intention does not change the fact that you can cause harm and it doesn't reduce the harm. And I, this is really, really important because people will get like, oh, like I didn't mean that. But that doesn't change the fact that you actually hurt that person or are continuing to hurt that person if you don't change. So yeah. you have to change. Well, Glenn, thank you so much for your time and you stay safe. Always a pleasure, Dave. You, you as well. I hope that as an industry, we continue to work on making technology more equitable for our friends that don't look like us.